So let's get started on this. Uh, and I want to also uh, say that uh, during the live stream today, I'll share with you some uh, tips and things on loose and expressive brush strokes and keeping your colors clean and that type of thing. But let's talk about brushes first. So um, one, the first thing is um, in working with loose and expressive, and this is actually, I think, uh, the first tip on here. Ah, very good. Okay, so the first tip is to use large brushes. And um, Helen Schaefer, my mother and I, uh, when you, we used to watch this show um, with Helen Van Wyck, the artist, and she would talk about that you start with a broom and you end with a needle. And so that's actually really kind of true. Um, so like here's my, <laughs> here's the needle. Um, this little detail, this fine liner brush, um, this is great for doing things like if you have to do a tiny little detail or if you're going to sign your name, that kind of thing. Uh, you use a little brush, but you can imagine how kind of crazy your painting would look if you tried to do everything with just a tiny, tiny brush. So the, the um, trick here is to try and use as large of a brush as you are barely comfortable with. It should feel a little bit strange. Uh, it, should it should feel a little bit too large, and if, and if that's the feeling, then you know you've got the right size brush. And then you move to a smaller brush um, as you go. So, um, so I started this, uh, you might notice that the canvas, so here's the edge of the canvas, if I lift it all the way up, it's just a regular white um, canvas, but I have toned it, which means I've put a color over the entire thing um, using a fluid yellow ochre, which is a neutral color. And I put that on uh, with this extremely large brush. This is a, this is a pretty three inch a house painting brush and then let that totally dry and the benefit of doing that is it leaves a wonderful kind of a special soft glow and you can cover it or you can leave, bit, leave bits of it showing but when you um, tone your canvas and some people will use turquoise some people use red some people use pink as they're under um, some people use gray what this will do for you is it will make it so that your middle values uh, well, it's easier to judge your middle values. It is intimidating and scary to work with a white canvas, but when you're working with uh, something that is, uh, has been toned, it makes it so much easier to go. And then let's talk a little bit about our paint. So I have um, a Masterson Stay Wet palette here, and I've got my colors. So I've got uh, these colors that I'm using are all colors out of tube. They're heavy body acrylics. Here's yellow ochre, for example. Uh, this is also by Golden. So the colors uh, using that we're using today, uh, Mars Black. I think it's Mars Black. It's either Ivory Black or Mars Black. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Mars Black. And then Phthalo Blue Red Shade, uh, French Ultramarine, Dioxazine Purple, uh, Alizarin Crimson, Naphthal Red. And, uh, oh, over here. Uh, the, this is a orange. Let me see what orange that is. Let's see where I think it's a pyrrole orange. Let's see here. Yeah, pyrrole orange, and then the yellow is a diarylide yellow, and we have a second yellow, a lighter yellow, and that is primary yellow, and then yellow ochre and titanium white. So now that we've got all of our paint established, I went ahead and planned out what colors are going to go where. So in looking at the watermelon, um, if you think about light coming through, you're going to have a shadow side and a side in sunlight. Now I've got really even lighting here um, while I'm painting, but normally for a still life, you're going to set it up so your light would be, for example, here and then your shadow might be here, or you can put your light here, and then your shadow side would be here. But when you do that, and I can show you on um, the painting uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, I planned out ahead that my light would be coming from here, and then I have a whole shadow side to work with. So for example, you might see that this is darker than this side, these are darker than this, and then this whole side of the fruit is lighter. And that's a, uh, a little trick or a way to get three-dimensionality in your work is to really pay attention to where the light and the shadows are coming. So, all right, so, 
So I see Helen is saying, Dina, you could put fruit into the watermelon shell. It looks so realistic. Mama, thank you for saying that. So I got a good start here on the, on the base of this um, Matterhorn watermelon. This is an 18 inch by 18 inch um, canvas. And now I wanna just go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna show you, I've got uh, just buckets of clean water. And just dipping the brush lightly into the water and then I'm going to go into the paint over here and let's pick out the lightest part of the or just kind of the middle colors um, just going in here so I mixed again I mix these colors up ahead of time planning out what colors we're going to go where so then you might be wondering, well, how do you know what colors are you're going to put where? And the way that I'll know what colors I want to use is I'm thinking about um, and planning out, we'll wipe this off, I've got a little too much water um, on my brush when I did this, and it's getting a sheer effect, but we can layer that, that's fine. Um, the way to know what colors to put where is you plan that out ahead. So you think about, like, for example, if the light is coming here, I want my lighter colors here and, and the warm, and then I'm going to put on this side the darker colors. So let's work first with just this white side or the light side, and let's now put in some of the um, this lighter color, and that's going to go right along the edge of our mountain or our, our watermelon mountain. And I'm thinking about these watermelon as mountains because they feel um, having such a giantly large watermelon like this. It just feels um, kind of like super large and uh, that kind of thing. So I'm going to go in with that same brush and I wiped it off over here on my thing and I can just go in tease this so I don't have a hard edge. So sometimes you want to have a hard edge and sometimes you want a soft edge when you're painting. And uh, if you have a mix of both light hard edges and soft edges in your work, uh, it'll give a sense of realism. So for example, these are soft edges in here in the shadow and over in here. And then we've got a hard edge over on that side of the rind. So let's go in and just start to introduce some of this color. And then now let's go in and I want to also just talk about keeping the color fresh. So uh, one way, let me just set the brush down, one way to make sure to keep your colors fresh is to mix your colors with a palette knife. And, um, and then, oh Zargo, you're saying you realize that you're a chaotic painter. Um, you don't plan ahead. Well, and, um, and how do you keep the paint wet? Uh, Lala's asking, how do you keep the, pa the paint wet? Okay, both of these are, are great comments. Um, how I'm keeping the paint wet is I would not try and paint any acrylic paints without using an acrylic paint palette. This is a, uh, so I'll lift and show you what's under here is just the tray. Let's see if you can see that. And then there is a wet sponge, and then there is a, um, it's a special, it's actually, um, I think, I want to say it's polyester, or it's a, uh, a um, piece of, it's not paper, but it's like an acrylic, I think it's like an acrylic um, layer, but it basically it's permeable, semi-permeable. So the wet sponge underneath is keeping all of the acrylic paint at the perfect wetness for painting and if I leave the cover off like this it will stay like this for hours and it's a um, wonderful thing to use. Um, I've got actually some of these Masters and Say Wet palettes out if you go up to Amazon.com shop Dina Tollefson I've got a whole bunch of art supplies out there if you're interested to see the art supplies I'm using but um, basically this uh, palette is allowing us to continue working and then not have to worry about ha don't have to worry at all about the paint drying out and that is like so important 
So um, I was, oh, and I was also going to say that um, in order to keep your clean color, let's we'll go back over here to our list. In order to keep clean color, mix your palette, your colors with a palette knife. You can mix uh, your colors with a um, paintbrush, but when you do that, then you aren't able to keep everything super clean. So here's a palette knife, for example. So I would just take a, if I'm going to mix a new color, take a scoop out of one of these colors, wipe it off on a towel um, when I'm done, and then mix the colors together, and it keeps everything, all little puddles of color fresh and clean. But that's a great way to um, really manage your color. And uh, the other trick here is when you're holding your paintbrush, the closer you hold it to the ferrule, it's kind of like holding a um, pencil, the closer you hold it to the, uh, oh, um, and then Helen is saying too, let's see, Masters and Stay Wet Palette's a game changer. Yes, it totally is. Um, and then, uh, Helen, you're saying that you agree the answer for, like, it's, an it's an answer for acrylic painters. It does really work. Yeah, it's, it's super. Um, other brands, I think there's some other brands that make it as well, make a version of it as well. I really happen to like the Masterson. It has a lid. Um, here's the lid for it. But um, they come in different sizes too. I have got the, the handy palette one, but basically you put this lid and then you snap it in place. And um, then I've actually kept my paint wet for weeks um, doing that if I ever need to. But uh, one thing about brushes, so if you hold your brush up really close, like you're holding a pencil like this, um, and then you work like this, you're going to get very stilted, and you might want that, uh, very precise and stilted words. But the further you hold your brush back away from the ferrule and, and the actual bristles, the more uh, gestural your um, strokes will be. So, uh, for example, uh, as I'm working here with this, if I am just wanting to go for a gestural feeling, a loose and gestural feeling, then I will just uh, run the brush across that way. And that's a, a nice way to go ahead and keep, um, keep your um, brush moving. And so another uh, little trick here is having music on if possible. So um, if you're painting and you have music and you're kind of moving around with this, it's a way to keep yourself loose and gestural. And then also, if you think of, this is my uh, other tip here for loose and expressive brush strokes, if you think of your brush strokes as fingerprints, uh, they're personal, they're one of a kind marks on your work, um, there's something special about seeing a brush stroke and it is uh, almost in the same way of writing a signature. It's one of a kind, and it's unique to you. So, um, so whenever you can, if you get an opportunity to add in and make a gestural mark, um, you can come back, if you like, and change the gestural mark. You can change it and make it more... Uh, uh, add more detail, you can do things like that. But if you try and leave those original gestural marks, it is a, um, a nice thing to do on your art because it really feels, it feels personal. So I'm gonna now, now that I'm done with this color, um, I'm going to rinse out my brush and I'm gonna work a little bit on this side of the painting for balance. And I've got multiple buckets of water here. So um, I have also a clean bucket of water that I'll dip in when I need clean water. So I've got a dirty water and a clean water. So now let's turn our attention over here. I'm going to dry the brush off and try and get all the water off. Now let's move on over here to this part of the mountain. of, um, And let's describe this. So if I'm thinking about the... Um, if I'm thinking about this light passing through here, I'm going to put in uh, some of our pyro orange and um, come up to the edge with the pyro orange right here like this. And um, looking for, we can get kind of a sharp edge, that's okay. 
uh, with that. And I'm also going to go in imagining that the light is coming from this other side here. Let's go ahead and, and make our shapes over here. So I'm going to switch now to a smaller brush. So, and to get some of this detail, let me move over now to a, what size is this? This is a, I don't know, about a three quarter inch brush. But now we can get um, a little bit of detail and I have a mark here that I don't want. So I'm going to just wipe that off with a little bit of the water. That's what's nice as acrylics. Uh, they dry pretty quickly, but if you have an, a thing that you don't want, you can usually wipe it over or you can also just paint over it too. It looks more like the watermelon flesh. Helen, yes, that's the, that's the goal is that, um, again, if we think about light coming here, and again, the light in my studio is not uh, perfect for a still life. It's really set up for a painting demonstration because I've got even light. But if I had a dark light only over here or dark only here, and then the light is passing through the flesh, we can get an idea of the painting is more realistic. I'm going to go into some of this naphthol red. And let's get some of that going over here. And I'm just going to follow along uh, with a loose and holding my paintbrush towards the back. Let's just go in here and tease some of that color up in here. All right. And then now in the center of the fruit, I'm going to think of, so I'll wipe off my brush here, and I'm going to be thinking about, can we get a kind of a purple color down in here, down in the heavy part of the fruit? So this is the part where the fruit is really wet, and the that's the thing about watermelon, are they have a kind of like as they sit, this wet, it, it gets kind of like a wet area down at the bottom. And we'll rinse this off, rinse out the brush, and I'll move this brush out of, to a different bucket. And now taking some of our darker red, so this red I mixed with uh, naphthol red and alizarin crimson. Let's go in now and put and layer some of this color on as well. So we can really get a feeling of the difference between the light and the dark. Okay, now you can see also that my water is getting dirty over here. So uh, what I'll do is I can still use that dirty water, but then finish it or rinse it uh, in the clean water because keeping those paint colors clean and fresh uh, that way we can um, do some layering and we can keep it all where we want. Now I'm going to go and clean up this area. So I'm going to set this brush off to the side. I don't want to, uh, since this, is, this brush is still a little bit dirty, I wouldn't want to let it dry out. Um, but I want to clean up this edge a little bit. So I want to show you these two colors. Uh, this was white, titanium white mixed with a little bit of the diarylloid yellow. And then this gray color I mixed with uh, yellow ochre white and a little bit of the Mars black. But this is the rind in shadow and that's the rind in sunlight. Okay, and so I'm gonna just check and see what you guys are saying here. Um, and, oh, okay, Lala, you're talking about the, um, that the glow of the underpainting has, uh, has added a lot of, of glow to the fruit. Yeah, it really does. It's amazing. Um, and if I were to have picked a different underpainting color, then, um, then, the, then the painting would have yet a different feeling. Okay, so now uh, I've gone in and now I'm going to also clean up this edge a little bit. So I'm going to go in with some of that white, the light color. And we can just clean up that edge by just going back over just like that. There we go. OK, 
Okay, now, while this is doing a little bit of drying, I want this to dry a little bit as we're working on it. But what we can do is uh, we can now think about, and I'll stick this back in the water, uh, let's think about adding something with our sky and adding something here with our uh, ground. So in thinking about that this is like, uh, it's almost like is it sitting on a tabletop or is it actually the Matterhorn Mountain sitting out, um, you know, in nature and as, as it would be in nature. So uh, it's kind of like a, a play on, uh, I guess, a play on words or a play on the idea of uh, if, if, you know, is it a, almost like a trompe l'oeil kind of a feeling. So um, let's go ahead and add some colors. I had planned out ahead that I wanted to use these two greens. So I have a light green here and a darker green here. And then we have, um, this is yellow ochre plus phthalo blue red shade. And then this is the, um, the primary yellow plus a small amount of black. And then here's primary yellow with even less black in it. And so I thought we could make some grassy effects by doing that. So um, I'm gonna now switch back over to that large brush and I'm gonna, whoops, ooh, it still has a lot of color in it. Okay, so did you see that when I had it in the water, this still had a lot of that watermelon paint in it. So let's get that really rinsed out. Now, if I wanted the green and the orange to mix together, then that would be, that would be fine, but at this point I don't. So, so let's go in first with our lighter color and thinking about the light coming in here. Let's just get this lightest area over here. We'll put a little bit of the light area back here next to the shadow side. And then we'll pick up some of the green of the darker and then just using, again, the brush, nice large brush. And we can blend it. You can blend by mixing, just if, you ha if your paint is still wet, you can blend something by just um, painting one color over the top while they're still wet or you can blend um, different ways. You can also blend by laying color over color over color in layers. That's another way to do it. Lots of different ways to blend. All right, and then this idea of the shadow. So I'm gonna go in and uh, now I'm gonna wipe the brush off to get a lot of the extra green off. And for the shadow part, let's go in and um, use some of the Phthalo blue red shade uh, mixed with the yellow ochre. We'll get some more of that. And this can be our shadowy area. So let's get some more of this color here. And then back in here. And then now um, in the darker shadow, Let's go in and, and thinking about the shadows. So if you think about your color wheel, you've got your um, yellow on the one side and then you've got blue. So you go like if you have green, the green that's uh, more in the sun would have more yellow and the green that has more in the shade would have more blue. So we're gonna go with darker and more blue kind of effect here in the shade and then just let that kind of fan out. And we'll rinse that off. Okay. And I'm gonna really give that a good wash. Then, let's go ahead and I'm gonna also soften this area. So going back in, I'm gonna soften this by um, 
just to kind of, by softening it, we're describing the terrain around it. So, um, and also creating a sense of movement. So we'll do that. And then in this distant set of trees back here, let's go in with a smaller brush. Do I have a smaller? Yeah, here we go. There's a little bit smaller round brush. And let's try and do some of this dark color here. So this is the, this color was made by taking the phthalo blue red shade, that's this one here, um, with yellow ochre. And actually that's what color you see here. And then uh, this color is the same color that you see here. So it's always kind of nice to repeat your colors if you can uh, throughout your work. Uh, that gives a sense of color harmony. So let's just kind of darken this a little bit. And I'm also gonna do, um, let's do just a little bit of purple in with that too. Um, dioxazine purple. Let's just kind of toss a little purple back in this area and see what happens. I kind of like the idea of um, purple. Whenever a person can put purple in, it's kind of a nice, nice thing to do. <laughs> Maybe that's just a, me and my love of purple. We'll get a little bit. Let's mix this just right on the, mixing this just right as we're working. There we go. But I think that just kind of, and I'm gonna really soften this because this is supposed to be, these are supposed to be um, far away. So I'm gonna really have a super soft edge here. Just going back sideways, I'm wiping the brush off and then just um, lightly touching the canvas. And I wanna get rid of any actual hard marks on here because we don't want our eye drawn to that area as a detail, but it's just kind of like it's like far away kind of a thing. So that's a trick if you want to have something seem far away. Um, try not to have any hard edges in it uh, when you're working. Okay, so so yeah, Lala, isn't that interesting what that crazy purple did, that dioxazine purple, um, making it darker and it added some depth um, to the painting. All right, so now let's get, get this rinsed off here. And now let's now work on our sky. Oh, oh my goodness, what did I do? Oh, I'm covered in paint. Oh no, oh dear. And now I think Helen and Dietrich are laughing because they know I really dislike getting dirty. So, okay, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you what to do. I'm, oh my goodness. Okay, I have to move this off to the side and just clean off here. Okay, let's just set our painting here. Let me, oh, look at, what did I do? Okay, I somehow got into, I got into this color. So I'm gonna just rinse off here. So we can't have, we can't have a dirty artist. That's not good. Some people, you know, for those of you out there who, get paint, but so like Helen, for example, Helen Schaefer, my mother, um, she is okay with getting paint on her, sh and I think for her that's part of her process, that she feels like she's uh, like more with the paint. A painted hand, yeah, oh my gosh. So, um, so I'm gonna get this off and then, um, so these paints are non-toxic, so it's not gonna hurt me to have it on my skin, but this is just kind of, driving me crazy to have this on here. All right, so we'll do that. And let's just get this wiped off and then we can get back to where we were. So, oh, I feel better now. And look, I even got a little bit of my paintbrush. So we'll get this guy wiped off too. There we go. Okay, now I feel good again. Oh my goodness, that was a little traumatic. A little bit of excitement here. <laughs> All right, so now back. So now let's work on this guy. Let me get this guy back uh, back over here. 
when I'm, the reason I'm uh, adjusting this is, do you see back here, this is already wired and ready to go, and I'm, the, what happened was it's sitting, the wire's pulling up a little bit, but I've already pre-named it, and I've signed it, and I have the name of the painting and the, and the size, and then that way, I don't have to put it on later, but my husband, Bill, um, does all the wiring for me, which I really appreciate. All right, so there we go. Okay, now we're back in business. So now let's go ahead and work on the sky. So in order to work on the sky, I'm going to pull out a, oh, and I still have a little blue here. Um, I'm going to get a inch and a half brush and just dip it in the water. So we're just going to get it slightly wet, wipe off the excess water. Uh, acrylics are kind of like, uh, if you've ever done a, um, We've all done this a, a time or two, yes, yeah. So if you've ever, um, if you've worked with watercolor, you'll know too that when you work with watercolor, you have to control the amount of water. It's the same kind of idea when you're working with acrylics, is you wanna control how much, um, you wanna control how much water you have on the brush. So I've got, I'm just dipping into, um, I made several blues ahead and blue near the earth, I'm going to have uh, with the uh, titanium white, a little bit of yellow ochre, and some of this phthalo blue red shade that's here. And then this one is the same mixture, but uh, more, uh, more of the phthalo blue red shade and less of, the, um, of this uh, yellow ochre. And then the third mixture is... Um, is using the ultramarine blue, which is a more purpley blue mixed with white. All right, so let's uh, get some of this on our canvas. There we go. And I'm gonna paint right up to the edge. So this canvas is a inch and a half thick and um, I'm painting right up to the edge of the canvas with the brush. And we've got a fair amount of a fair amount of paint on the brush as we're working. And now I'm going to go in and turn the brush and allow it to touch right up to the edge of our painting of our uh, watermelon. And coming in so I'm I'm a I'm approaching it from a sideways view so that the tops of the trees, we can go in and have a really soft edge and I'll show you how to get a really soft edge with that. So we've got first this color here and now I'll come in with a dry brush. So this is a completely dry round brush and so this part is dry and this part's wet so I'm just going to go in here and soften this by just putting the brush and wiping any excess off. And if I don't have it close enough, I can always go in and uh, put a little more paint down closer in. So we'll do that here. And same thing here. I don't want it to actually touch too far in. I want to have that kind of a soft edge there we go. Okay, so I have a soft edge here in the in the background, and this will push the trees back, and it will make our subject, which is the watermelon, stand out because there are hard edges here, and then soft edges in the back. Okay, so now there's a tiny bit. You can see there's hardly any paint on the brush. I'm just going to wipe that off, but I will stick it in the water because if I don't, that tiny amount of residual that we have left on there, um, we'll stiffen it and we'll ruin the brush. Yeah, it does soften it up, Bill. Yes, it does. Okay, so now going in um, with the middle color or the mid sky, just going to go in and lay that color on. And I can also allow little bits of that golden color from that we laid in there can allow little bits of that to peek through, which is a um, 
kind of gives a softness. Okay, so now the top of the Matterhorn actually has kind of a curved shape and it kind of goes the actual mountain. So we'll just do this with it and get the softness going here. And now I'm using my brush and going up and down with that. And I'm also going to take a dry, just any dry brush, and I can soften transition between the light area and the dark area by just kind of uh, brushing it rapidly over the top and wipe off the extra. And now we'll get a soft edge going there. And over here on this edge, we'll soften this as well. And now let's come in with our final color which is the ultramarine blue, French ultramarine blue, plus a small amount of titanium white. And for those of you that have used, uh, if you've used titanium white mixed with ultramarine blue, the ultramarine blue is not a very strong tinter. In other words, it, um, it's kind of a weak color as far as like how strong it is next to white. And so you, have, so you have to be careful to not put too much white in it as it really cuts the color down fast. And that's in contrast with Thalo Blue Red Shade. That's this one here. They both look dark on the palette, but when you put this Thalo Blue Red Shade, if you put that in with some white, it, it takes a ton of white to make that a light color. But um, if you have your ult French Ultramarine, just a tiny bit of white will get you a color like that. Okay, so now let's go in and just, I'm going to just let the brush do the blending for us. And I kind of like this feeling of this uh, bit of orange that we have here at the top, so we'll just let that go on here. All right, now the next step is I want to adjust a little bit the top of the mountain. So I'm going to put... Um, Go in here, I've got just a small brush. So remember what Helen Van Wyck would have us do is we begin with a broom and we finish with a needle. So I'm gonna go in and take a little bit of this orange uh, that we had at the top. And the Matterhorn has got a little bit of a dark color in here. So we'll take a little of the red. And it has kind of an interesting, like a little form at the top. And we'll take more of the orange and lay that in over here as well. And then we need to get a little bit more pink to match this up at the top. And then we're going to take that softer color, so that original softer color that we have, and let's put this over in here. There we go. And then also take this softer color that we have. And let's go in and redefine that soft early part of our watermelon. And then we're ready now to add in uh, some seeds. So, to make seeds, what I like to do is I take a round brush, and then on the dark side, I'm going to go directly into alizarin crimson, and then, oh, Megan, thank you so much. Um, yeah, and Elf, you're saying that the Stay Wet palette's a must for acrylic, otherwise you waste paint. Yeah, I hear you, absolutely. It is crazy to me because um, I, I uh, thought, oh, I'm just going to do a quick little thing the other day. And I just got out, a, um, I got out a palette that I would use for painting with oil and, um, and one of those like a disposable palette just that, that with paper on it, waxed paper. And oh my gosh, my paint dried almost immediately and it was really frustrating. 
So, um, so when I'm thinking about here, I've got our actual watermelon back out here. But if you can see, do you see that the seeds? This one has. This is a uh, no seed watermelon <laughs> that our wa that our grocery store had. But seeds, uh, black seeds, uh, whether they're black or white, they will tend to grow in a shape that kind of faces up like this. So um, when we're putting our seeds in, we're going to uh, try and put, this is like the flesh of the watermelon. What happens is, is you have, um, sometimes you have it where the seed is uh, at the bottom like these are, but they tend to always kind of go in a row. So I'm using that uh, alizarin crimson. I'm going to rinse off the brush and then wipe that off over here. And then I'll go into just the napthal for the sun side. We'll go into the napthal red. And when the seed sits in, if you, if you kind of study your fruit a little bit, your, um, if you study and look at your watermelon, what's kind of interesting about them is they will... And we can kind of just have a few marks like that. The watermelon will um, have these little areas where the seed sits, but it kind of sucks in a little bit. I guess if that's this, if you can see that, see that on the fruit, like these little bits of area where it, like a little area, and then the seed just sits in a pocket in there. So we're trying to get that feeling, and we'll put maybe one here. And then we can fill it then with our dark color. And then the, um, what about the wet versus dry canvas? Um, Lizzie is asking, what about the wet versus dry canvas? Um, Pavlov's dog, <laughs> Lala. Oh, your, your mouth is watering, Lizzie. You're funny. Lizzie, you are great. And if you guys ever watch Lizzie's channel, um, she always has something like, uh, like some caramels or some chocolates or something that she's talking about. And I watch her channel and I get very hungry um, <laughs> watching. And well, you know, Elf does this stuff too with, uh, um, Elf was just painting some vegetables, which I guess is, is also kind of a healthy thing. But um, just going in now with the round brush. Uh, the reason I'm using a round brush is because a round brush has got the ability to make a sharp point or a big, um, a big movement like that. So, let's say movement. Um, a round brush, you can get a tiny little mark, or you can press down on it and get a. Feel like I'm pressing down to make the seed shape, and we'll do the same over here. So I'm just pressing down, and we can just do the seed and do a couple different shapes of seeds by just doing right onto that wet paint. Just going in and just a little flick of the brush. And you want some of the um, area that you painted for it to show this. Um, you want some of it to show like like that where the pocket is, where the seed is sitting. Um, if, you, if you cover the entire area, then it kind of defeats the purpose of making that pocket first. And we'll just do a little mark there. And then uh, we've got one here as well. All right, so one other thing that I like to do too is add a little highlight to those seeds. And so what I'll do for the highlight is in the areas um, where the sun is hitting, we'll use this color. And for the dark areas in the back, we'll use this gray color, which is the same as what we've got on our rind. So starting first with the areas in shadow, just getting a little bit, uh, just a tiny bit here on the end. We'll just do a tiny highlight, like just a little bitty highlight on, and each can be a little bit different on the uh, seed itself because the seeds are very shiny. And so you want to kind of capture that highlight. And then now over here in the bright light, uh, just again, on the back of uh, just a tiny amount of paint. Actually, I have a little too much paint on. I'm going to wipe some off. I want to have, see that, just a tiny bit of paint. And we'll just do a highlight. And not all the highlights should look identical. Because you want to think about the fruit being in a different position. Now, 
I made a boo-boo here, so I'm going to fix my boo-boo. I got my highlight where I didn't want it. So let's just wipe the highlight off and just make a new one. There, we take it off. And um, a size without seeds. Yeah, Lizzie, that's what we've got is one up here in the, um, from the grocery store. I got one of those, like a personal pan pizza kind of one. A personal pan. And you know what? The highlight is not looking right here. So let me wipe it again. And if your highlight is not what you're wanting, just wipe it off and, and then just work on it until you get it the way you want it. All right. And then the last thing I want to show you here is, um, and did we go through all of our techniques? Uh, loose and expressive, we've got making sure we're using large brushes, have the music on, and thinking about our brush strokes as fingerprints or as a identity that we put on our painting. And then for clean color, we want to make sure that we mix our colors with a palette knife whenever possible. Keeping the paintbrush um, clean in between rinsing it, wiping it in between our colors, and then map or plan out the colors before we do the paint. So you'll notice that when, um, when we started, I had already pre-mixed and planned out my grass in sunlight, my grass in the middle, my grass in shade, and then the different colors we would use for the sky, starting with the horizon and moving up to the top of the sky, and then our colors for the, uh, for the watermelon in, um, in sunlight, and then our colors for the watermelon uh, uh, on the dark side of the watermelon. But what I'd like to just show you here now is how to do your signature. So uh, signatures can be a little intimidating, but they don't have to be if you have a liner brush. So this is a liner brush. And the trick is now I've been normally using the paint. So the paint is just coming out of the tube and you see that the paint is kind of thick and gloppy. But what we have to do when we do a signature is I'm going to dip the, um, I'll show you with a palette knife. You have to make your paint the consistency of ink. And that is the trick to doing a signature. So let me, now I added a couple drops of water to the black. And let me just get some inkiness. And adding the water isn't going to hurt the paint, especially on the stay wet palette. And so if you can see that, I'm making just a very inky color. And then I'm going to test it with the brush and see if it's uh, the right consistency. And I think we've got a good consistency here. Let me wipe the extra off and test it now with the brush. So I had dipped my brush in water. And let me just uh, get this into here. Yep, that's a good consistency. It's very inky. And that's what we're looking for. So I'm just going to start my signature here. And again, uh, the signature is, um, you want to keep your signature always, ideally, you always sign it the same way. So that um, people who see your work will recognize that signature. And do you see that I'm just reloading the paint when I feel like I, I'm not able to do the entire signature with one load of paint, but I can go in and do it. There we go. Uh, I can go in and do it with several passes, dipping into that inky consistency of water. All right, well, um, I want to thank you guys for joining me here today, and it's been a lot of fun, and I hope that you'll come back again, and, and I appreciate you guys being here and I hope that you'll come back again and s and oh in the unspeakable I didn't see you here before and also if anybody else has been here before and I haven't um, said hello to you or you wrote a comment I will be going back and reading all of your comments in the um, upload later but I want to thank you so much for being here so until next time it's Dina Tollefson and all my best to you bye bye